Hey guys, welcome back to the Be Lead, Be Real, Be Bold podcast. I'm here with a special guest from one of my favorite places in the world, San Diego, California, uh, Dr. Jill McDivitt. How are you? Fantastic. How are you? I'm great. How long have you lived in beautiful, sunny San Diego? Coming on five years. Moved from Philadelphia. And do you absolutely love it? I absolutely love it. It was the greatest act of self-care of my entire life, was, was just up rooting and moving across the country to San Diego. It is just a joy to be here. I got the chance to visit last Labor Day weekend for a bachelor party, and there were 16 of us guys in our late 30s uh, traveling to San Diego together, and I don't think we're allowed back, actually. <laughs> you had a little too much fun? I think that that's the point and the purpose, but um, the groom would deny everything, and <laughs> our official pact uh, prevents us from actually speaking on it. So. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. <laughs> I won't ask that. Well, you're, you're definitely one of our most unique guests to date. Um, it looks as though you're the only person that you know of in the world that has started your uh, experience through human sexuality from your bachelor's all the way through your PhD. Is that right? Yes, as far as I know, I am the only person who has three degrees in human sexuality. So that's, I just hang on to that title. I think it's pretty cool. If you're going to go to school for a lot of years, why not sex, right? No more. <laughs> <laughs> I, am, I am on board with that idea for sure. Now, how did you choose and why did you choose to get into that specific field? So I have been interested in the study of human sexuality since I was a young teenager. And at the time being 14, 15 years old, I was in love for the first time. Puberty was a thing, body changes and feelings and all that you know, sexual and emotional stuff that goes on at that time in your life. And I was really confused and really embarrassed and ashamed of everything. I didn't know that any of it was normal. And so it took me to kind of discovering on my own through reading um, what was going on, making sense of it. And so when I started to understand, oh, it's supposed to happen like this, and this is all normal, I had this aha moment of saying, well, like, well, when, why was I made to feel ashamed of something normal? And how are other people feeling? And why does it have to be like this? And so at that young age, I was like, I want to do this for a living. I want to be the person that helps drag this out of the shadows in other people's lives. And so I started reading sex books and talking to my friends and teaching my friends. And it just kind of developed into this passion. I felt really good about the way um, it felt to be trusted with other people's secrets or to be able to like validate other people's experiences. So I just kind of was like, oh, I should study this in college. And then, I, you know, 15 years later, I have all these degrees and it's like a career. So it kind of like built from there. And who is it that you find that comes to you most? Is it men or women or both? It depends on the service, so, which I find very interesting. So I do a lot of sex ed for grownups, I call it. I teach workshops. I do classes. I do in-home kind of Sunday morning brunch, get the friends together, pour some mimosas, let's do a sex ed workshop in your living rooms, colleges, you know, so I do a lot of sex ed for adults, and that is almost exclusively women. I also offer uh, coaching, and that is very, very much uh, male dominated. And I have some theories about that, perhaps, but yeah, it tends to skew in those directions. Yeah, what is your assumption of why men would choose coaching over maybe the sex education part? A few reasons. I think one is that um, to take a sex education class, there's a certain assumption that there is something to learn. And so that requires a little bit of vulnerability of saying, well, I don't already know everything there is to know about sex. It also requires showing up in, uh, around other people, right? Because they're classes. So either getting your friends together or other couples together to take a class or attend something that I'm hosting for public. Um, so that requires some vulnerability, whereas the coaching is one-on-one -on -one and it doesn't have those assumptions. And I think also there is this piece of that maybe women are more likely to uh, be be interested in self-improvement before it becomes a crisis. 
So by the time someone needs coaching, they're probably not in a really good spot. Um, whereas education, you don't have to be in a crisis. You can be like, hey, this is valuable to me. I want to take a class. Whereas if you're like going to hire a sexologist to coach you, you're probably not in great shape. So, you know, classic uh, mental health, societal things, whereas men kind of aren't um, given the space to necessarily feel like they can go reach help before it's critical. Yeah, I can absolutely relate to that. Um, I'd been through counseling a couple of times throughout my life. And you said a, a key word in there when you were talking about your experience as a teenager that uh, ashamed is how you felt about the way your body was changing. But we're always changing throughout our life. And then when we get stuck in our early 20s, late 20s, mid 30s, and we feel like we need some help, why is there shame attached to um, maybe the societal norms around sex? Our society thrives on sexual shame. It is in our American DNA culturally. So we just have a lot of hangups. We have a lot of issues. That is, I think, the root of almost all of individual and relational um, sexual issues stem from the culture, which is, this is wrong. This is, I'm going to be judged for this. Um, this is embarrassing. So yeah, it's all of our, it's that classic um, Puritan <laughs> sex phobic. Yeah, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And it is a beast to try to fight. I mean, that's what I do every day for a living is try to fight this machine. And it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. One person at a time. That's all it's going to take, you know? And um, so we have this culture of like work hard, prioritize work, and then prioritize our self-care last. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm a huge fan of setting healthy boundaries. Why is setting healthy boundaries a big part of self-care? It is one of the biggest parts of self-care. Um, so sexual self-care is something that's really important to me. And it's something I've done a lot of work on. And boundaries is the big piece because boundaries is about um, honoring your own rights to your own stuff, right? Whether that is um, what you want, what you don't want, what you'll accept. Um, so it is prioritizing yourself first, basically. And in a work hard, Puritan kind of mindset and framework, it's about, it's about sacrifice. It's about foregoing pleasure, foregoing joy, foregoing sleep, um, so that you can work, 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 work. And so boundaries doesn't fit into that model because boundaries is saying, no, I'm not going to go to work right now. I'm not going to show up early. I'm not going to answer my phone on weekends. I'm not going to, right, because I'm taking care of myself and my own pleasure and my sexuality and all those pieces, it doesn't fit into that framework. So to do sexual self-care and set boundaries is revolutionary. It's very powerful to do that because you're going against the entire system. Mm -hmm. yeah. So as I was uh, learning a little bit more about you, um, setting boundaries is part of sexual self-care and saying yes and no at the right times are also part of that. Could you tell me more about how these three things are related? And maybe they're not related. I don't know. Please tell me. Yeah. Ooh, I love these, these lines of questions. These are fantastic. Um, because I love talking about this. Um, so with the um very sex phobic idea that sex is only for procreation and a heterosexual, blah, 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 marriage, all those things, that are, that leaves a whole lot of opportunities for saying no, right? Like most sex we're supposed to be saying no to, unless it's missionary for reproduction with our heterosexual spouse, right? So that means that we've been trained to say no, to say no, to say no. And so there is some value in that. And obviously it's about honoring what we want, what we like, and being able to say, I don't want to do that and having that be respected. So learning how to say no is important. But then the other piece of that is learning that like, you can say yes to this, like you can do this. Um, so if it's outside of this uh, socially prescribed acceptable ways of having sex, you don't have to feel embarrassed about it. You don't have to feel ashamed about it. You can say yes to it. You can um, do it. So it's, it's kind of the flip side of both, right? You can say no, and consent obviously is important in valuing our own boundaries, and then saying yes, hell yeah, I want to have a whatever, 
have a threesome on the back of the whatever, right? So both can be true. And so finding that balance is what's important. And in your coaching and in your um, counseling philosophy, how do you build on a client's strengths and leverage what's working for them in order to move them forward from sexually distressed to satisfied to flourishing? Yes. So I love strength-based models. Um, I just think it's so empowering to know that you already have so much going on for you that's working and that there's more working than not working. And so when people come to coaching and they're having an issue, that's all they want to focus on, right? That's the way the human mind works. It's like, I can't do this. This is so big. This is such a problem. And when you look at, well, what's already going well and building on it, it can be super powerful. So for instance, with boundary setting, right? So say I have a client who's coming to me and they really feel a lot of shame every time they speak up sexually. Every time they tell their partner what they like, they just have a lot of you know, feelings in their gut and they're like, oh, this is, I just can't do it. I can't do it, right? So one thing we might do, an exercise might be in the session or in homework to, to write out some sentence stacks like I like or I love some more of or could you please whatever or I like it when and let them think about what it is they actually like and don't like and want and don't want. And then when we come back in the session and we unpack how that experience was just doing it on paper, they can pull out what went well. And then we build on that to say, okay, maybe you can try saying one of them in, in real life. And then how do we build on that? So you start going in the trajectory of this is working versus like going down the hole of like, this isn't working. Right. Yeah. So I think it's really powerful to move people forward. Yeah. It, I can relate a lot to that as a personal trainer for the past six and a half years and coaching people to understand what they're good at and then um, not necessarily focusing on their weaknesses as much as their strengths. So is that how you're like a personal trainer for someone's sex life? <laughs> kind of how I describe myself because when you're at cocktail parties and you're you're meeting strangers and you do the whole hey so what do you do wine and I'm like oh god sit down because I say sexologist and then it's like a two-hour conversation right at so least. my quick yeah. little elevator pitch is like I'm a personal trainer for your sex life like what you imagine you'd want to do with your body with a personal trainer as far as fitness what some of your roadblocks might be you know and, and conceptualizing in that but think about it with sexuality also keeping in mind that sexuality is so much more than the body. That's only one small percent. It is our identity. It's our experiences. It's our relationship with ourselves and the world and others. You know, so there's so much about our sexuality other than just like the mechanics and the parts. So when you think about it like that, yeah, that's how I consider myself a personal trainer. Yeah. <laughs> so when we combine healthy boundaries, uh, the ability to say yes, the ability to say no, do all of these steps or mindset shifts help somebody become less ashamed of themselves and also um, help them flourish with a partner or by themselves or with their future partner? Absolutely. I think sexual self-care starts with yourself, right? Right in the word. But there's ripples. I, I am a fan of uh, ripple theory, as I call it, that when you're um, doing something well for your sexuality, it's going out into the world. So it's going to impact the relationship. It's going to impact things that have nothing to do with sex, your work, your family life, and all of those things. So, but you have to start with your own messages because yes, it's the society telling you that you're not supposed to do this or you're supposed to look like that or behave this way or what have you, but then we internalize it and it becomes our internal dialogue. So you have to challenge that in yourself. And that is really the work of self-care because it is work. It's hard. And the, and the ripple effects can go into self-efficacy and confidence. And guess what? It's almost like the compound effect where we're just layering one positive strength on top of another, on top of another. And then a little ways down the road, what do you know? Life gets a whole lot better sexually physically mentally emotionally <laughs> yes yes i think of it like you're building a body of evidence 
that you can do this and that you are worthy of it and that it's important. So the more you keep building on strengths, like you said, and you look back with the self-efficacy and you're like, look at all this experience I have in being sexually healthy. And I guess it makes me a sexually healthy person. And you kind of take on that identity. And then when you take on that identity, it self-fulfills and all those things. So yes, I love how much you, you are jiving right here. I love how much you like get, my, <laughs> you get this. Um, I, sometimes it's like hard to explain what I mean by all these concepts, but you're like right on it. Sure. Well, I might have um, become a tad obsessed with uh, modern dating and our culture as it sits. Um, it came about from like this on to the next kind of mentality where like the grass is not always greener where on the other side, it's greener where you water it. And it always starts with you in every phase of your life. Yes. Thank you. I might use that quote. I'm going to quote you on that. I love that because I've had, ooh, hello. You're okay. um, I've had, this has been in the last like maybe year that this has become my hot button. I mean, in the world of sexuality, there's a lot of hot button and politically relevant issues for sure. Um, but this one has gotten me a lot around this dating, um, Oh, what word would we use? Just like awful behavior, just unkind, cruel treatment, um, bizarre ways of like thinking that this is going to work, but it's not going to, thinking that the next swipe is going to be the magical thing. <sighs> Decision fatigue and all these things that play into it. Yeah. So yeah, I could go on about that. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. And, mm -hmm. and, I've experienced a lot of different things, uh, up, down, positive, negative, in my dating journey, I guess, um, almost two years now that I've been single, pretty much straight through, met a couple of great people in there um, that I wanted a relationship with, wasn't the right timing, okay, that's fine, um, I can't want it enough for the both of us. Yeah. And when we're talking about, like, this negativity in our culture today around dating how do we switch it to a positive mindset collectively and individually yeah a lot of the work that i do centers around this idea of compassion and i try to center compassion in a lot of things because when you start to boil it down really that becomes so important and if you look at this idea of ghosting and the the whole dick pic phenomenon and just on and on and on in that way. What you really come to is this idea is that people are not being at all compassionate to this potential partner who is a human being on the other side of the screen. Right. And so that is not at all taken into account. It would appear if you look at observe people's behaviors and you start to be like, clearly there's just not a lot of empathy happening. Because if there was, you wouldn't treat people this way, right? So I think really, to me, I always said sex education is compassion education. So when I talk about that I do sex ed for adults, that's a lot of the a part of it. Compassion for ourselves and others. And like you said, even if it doesn't work or it's not a fit right now or this person is not for you, this doesn't mean that we need to treat <laughs> It feels like you're teaching like five-year-olds, right? But like this is what we need to start to understand because we've really moved away from it, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, think, I think there's a like a foundation of misunderstanding in our relationships nowadays and I'm, I'm a huge fan of Stephen Covey he's been coming up a lot recently both in my business and my personal life and he said he he has this saying of seven um seven habits of highly effective people where you want to be un, you want to understand others in order to be understood yourself and you're your route of um, heading towards compassion in all of your teaching is right up our alley because we have grace and compassion for ourselves and for others in understanding where they're coming from, who they are right now, where they've been and where they want to go. Hmm. But all of that takes time and it all, all of that takes effective communication. And that's really not what we're doing right now in our culture and our society where text messages actually start relationships. Um, Snapchat starts relationships, Facebook, Instagram, all of the above. There's a disconnect 
long before there's a connection. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's, I hate to blame technology because I actually met my husband on Craigslist, believe it or not, like 10 years, 11 years ago now. Um, so I, I, I love that technology is a tool. The problem is that we're not using the tool in an effective manner, right? So mm-hmm. at that time when I was online dating and there was Craigslist, there was Match.com and um, Plenty of Fish. Those mm-hmm. were one, two, three, or eHarmony. But that was like very expensive for me at that time. I was just out of college. and wasn't ready to pay $40 a month or whatever, right? Hopefully so, it only takes one month to get there. <laughs> so, but what I found was very different than the experience that seems to be the case today. And so the technology is, is the technology, right? It's, but the people have treated it differently. So I think it's very much a, a human issue right now for of sure. using technology in a way that is compassionate and, and works for you, gets you the outcome that you desire. Yeah, it's almost like everything ties back into our busy puritanism a mindset and our culture of like, I thought I was too busy to meet somebody organically. And so I was primarily meeting people on the apps and it wasn't going very well for me. So I ditched the apps. I broke up with the apps. And then like 10 days later, I met somebody in person and that was great, but it still didn't work out. So what it comes back to all the time is it starts with me because no matter where I'm at, there I am. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the foundation of, what we're talking about here on the BBR podcast is starting with foundational beliefs for me makes me stronger, more resilient when I do go out there and I meet people on, in all different ways, like on an app or through Instagram or organically in person. And we c- can't necessarily just limit ourselves to one pipeline of meeting people. Mm-hmm. It's almost like we need this community of people around us for support plus introduction plus question and answer when it comes up like yourself. Yeah. I mean, I think it's like the universe. I mean, people have been figuring this out for a hundred thousand years <laughs> until te- before 10 years ago and there was apps. So people meet all kinds of ways and sometimes you're not expecting it. And sometimes it can be intentional. Um, but I think it's about being open to it, right? Like open to receiving that, and having a positive attitude about it. And so the limiting belief of like, I don't have time for this, or like there's nobody out there, or this isn't the way to do it. Or I'm not worthy. I mean, you you said that one earlier and like I stored it in the back of my mind to talk about limiting beliefs and foundational beliefs. Mm, We're just hitting all the marks here. (laughs) Like I said, I've spent spent a lot of time on this and maybe a little bit too much time, but uh, and, you know, it prepares us for educating other people on what's truly important in 2019. So keep going with those limiting beliefs of like, there's no good guys out there. Um, I can't seem to meet anybody. And then they're super negative. And how do we switch that individually to a positive mindset uh, train of thoughts? Yeah. I, 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 to be fair, though, it's, it's easy to start to get discouraged after the hundredth time that someone tells you to like go ask yourself because you don't answer his email his you know messages or whatnot right because that's the other piece is that for women especially this can get very abusive and very violent and very scary so there's this other piece of like here you are here looking for love and people are being not just rude or standoffish but actively hostile and violent with their words so it can be discouraging and i want to make space for that but Also, I think um, this goes back to the boundaries, right? So like, what are you going to set your boundaries around? Are you not going to answer responses at 2 a.m.? Are you going to want to meet or not want to meet somebody after X number of communications back and forth or whatever? Um, You know, how are you want to be treated and how are you going to treat them? I think when it comes to being positive, like when you just put out the kindness first, it might not be returned, but sometimes it might more so be, right? So like, you know, the golden rule of just like going out there and treating potential partners how you'd like 
to be treated and see how far that gets you. Um, there's also a little psychology to it, right? Like there is, as far as the grass is greener, psychology of this belief, myth, that, um, that the more you throw at the wall, like in the see what sticks model is not, not good, not helpful, <laughs> right? So like think about um, people who live in a small town and went to high school with like eight people somehow found a partner and they're happily married. Like, how did that happen? And you have like 20,000 single people on your phone in your city within two miles and none of them, I don't believe it. I believe that it's more that you think that somehow the more times you keep trying this, the better the chances are. So it's about, the analogy I use is like, who's happier with their college experience? The person who like, visits two campuses, picks the one that gives them the most scholarship and goes, or the person who has like an Excel spreadsheet of like 5,000 universities and looks at all their stats and da 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 for like the whole senior year of high school, right? Like they're always going to be second guessing themselves like, oh, but maybe that other school, like maybe I should have like, was this didn't go right? So maybe I made the wrong choice in this constant, like, right? And we do this with humans. There was that other person, I swiped on them, but maybe I should have, but I don't know, but this guy's nice, but maybe that other one's nicer. Versus just like go on dates with two people <laughs> and see which one works, right? It is like counterintuitive, but it's actually true. Yeah, you're hitting home there with the statement of like, oh, I like him, but, or um, I might've swiped on him, but, and it resonates with me because of Amir Levine's work in attached and an avoidant attachment style of like, oh, I really like her, but finding excuses to not date that one person because maybe there's fear of missing out or maybe there's, Oops. sorry, Oops. or maybe there there's a lack of confidence or that limiting belief of I'm not worthy of love and that that trend has been coming up a lot or i'm sorry that theme has been coming a lot a lot to me in this world although i don't have that same limiting belief of mm -hmm. not being worthy of love yeah there's there's a component that feels like it's um that we forget that there's an actual human again that goes to that like empathy component of like this is a person of course they're imperfect start with that start with their imperfect and then move forward right rather than like see look at that thing i can't i can't handle that um like yeah you probably can like there's very i mean obviously there are deal breakers but like do you want to be happy or do you want to be perfect so right because if we're always seeking perfection we're never going to find it mm -hmm. and in general i'm not even a huge fan of the word deal breakers uh, if it's not the right fit it's not the right fit and i've I've come away with a lot of really good friendships from women that it wasn't the right fit for me. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, this, this episode comes out in a little while, but next Monday's episode is a woman I met on hinge and we just knew that we weren't the right fit for each other, but she came and she interviewed with me on the podcast. It was amazing. <laughs> Fantastic. And now we have a professional relationship and a personal one where we can call each other friends and it was a win, even though neither one of us were perfect and certainly not perfect for each other. But I think what you bring up in that example is that you both had this, I don't even know if I want to use the word maturity, but like this um, realistic view that like, it doesn't have to be what I often hear is like, if it's not going to work romantically, then the then hell nothing with you. at all. Yeah. Like you're a this, you're a that, fill in all the slurs and insults. Mm -hmm. and that is what is like a real shame is that it becomes like a very hostile situation is like oh you didn't answer my messages or, or like oh it didn't work out so now like you're my sworn enemy mm -hmm. and harassing each other and it just seems very very <laughs> vile like it just seems very difficult yeah, yeah. way to maneuver through the world it's, it's kind of a it's an unhealthy environment as a whole collectively where people treat people without empathy grace and compassion and if we turn to a book a great book called the four agreements of like um be impeccable with your word and always try your best and just the simplest of life principles that we can make decisions from i was having a conversation with a random person this morning about how do we make our decisions and they come from our core values 
And a person who flips their lid on being rejected once, twice, um, and they flip their lid, that's not a person with core values that I want to align with at all. No, <laughs> that's, that's dangerous, right? Because that's violent tendencies, possibly, or just a, a long road of um, that type of explosiveness. It's just, yeah, unhealthy, I guess yeah. would be a word. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And that's when it comes down to a deal breaker or a red flag for me is, is really what, where are they making their decisions from? Is it, is it from a healthy place of like, oh, you know what, I'm just going to set a boundary here. Dave, you texted me at 11 o'clock at night. That's a little bit outside my boundaries. Maybe we shouldn't date. But if we bump into each other out and about, hey, that's totally fine. How's the podcast going? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So I, I have um, I've asked all of my questions oh, wow. and normally I <laughs> like we just we just went off and it was so much fun and normally I complete our conversation with if there's one thing we touched on briefly or didn't quite get to that you want us to know that's so important uh, what would that be oh gosh Oh, so many things. Um, right now, what feels real, what's like moving me really na- right now, what's feeling really good to me right now is about the sexual self-care. We did spend a good amount of time talking about it. What's, oh, darn it. What's interesting to me is sometimes how walking the walk of the things that we preach do we do in our various lines of work, right? And so I took a vacation I just got back from a vacation and it took me a really long time. Like it was a battle with myself to do something, to just like be on this trip, to not get the Wi-Fi on this cruise ship, to actually just like be caring for myself in the way that I am promoting people to do for the sexual self-care retreat that I am hosting in San Diego. So I'm asking people to go on vacation here and learn about sexual self-care with me. And was I actually doing this? myself and so sometimes what's interesting is how much um and how powerful accountability is as coaches right this is something that we're able to offer other people is and needing it for ourselves sometimes as well as saying like this is so important but also we're um creatures of this culture as well and the and the and the systems that make us believe that we have to work 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 and go 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 and not take time for ourselves so i think yeah i guess that would be just the one thing that i would love to touch on again is and i think that ties into authenticity too wow look at that pulling it full circle of like like we're not perfect in the way that we teach what what we're passionate about and holding ourselves accountable to do those things that we know are important yeah, absolutely. We we jump off of social media every single weekend as a small group, and we run this um, detox every weekend by text message. And the accountability piece is such a tricky thing for this because I'm not on social media myself, but I also have to tune in with the people who are participating and saying, hey, are you guys on social media? And, <laughs> <laughs> and because of that, community and the support that we're giving each other i believe that it's as authentic as it possibly can be but am i perfect absolutely not no like um what i what i needed to come to understand is that if i take a social media break from friday at eight to monday at eight will my business still be there when i get back on monday morning of course it's not going anywhere Mm -hmm. (laughs) so i'm glad you brought that up because even mm-hmm. as coaches, we need accountability. Every coach needs a coach. Yep. And throughout my personal training career, I've sought out mentors. I've been a mentor. I've hired coaches. Um, some great, some not so great, but they were all part of the puzzle of getting us to the end result, which is what our listeners are most likely looking for is a happy, healthy, long-term relationship. Mm-hmm. Yep. And for me, that starts with yourself for me. Yeah. You have to show up to show up as your best sexual self and relationship self. You have to do the work. If there's one place that somebody should, I'm sorry, I hate the word should. If there's the best place for somebody to start working 
on themselves because it starts with you before they get in a relationship what resource out there or, or where would you point them um not a quick fix at all because there's no such thing but like mm -hmm. uh, what's a what's a great place to start yeah so if you're on speaking of social media, I love, there's a lot of people that I follow or hashtags on Instagram that I follow like sex positive, like body positive and words like that. Um, there's also, you know, some actual sexologists and others that do this type of work and they post things that to see it in your feed daily starts to create at least an awareness that these things are important. So I think at the beginning, like you could at the very least just start to do stuff like that. Um, yeah, I think that would be a good place to start. I agree. A healthy diet is not always just what you eat. It's what you watch on TV. It's what you listen to on podcasts. People oftentimes like, hey, Dave, listen to this true crime podcast. And I'm like, you know what? I, I'm totally interested, but that's way too negative for me in my life. And I just don't want to put it into my subconscious my conscious mind at all so all of the other podcasts that i digest like man talks for with connor beaton or dax shepherd's expert on expert those are both great for me to be realistic to consume healthy um positive oriented uh, context and material so i'm all about following like mark groves on instagram and um who's the lmft married to connor uh, she's my, anyways, I'll put them in the show notes below. My favorite Instagram <laughs> accounts, uh, that bring positivity into my life. There's actually a totally random girl in London that I follow on Instagram named, uh, elderflower66, I think, or something like that. And we chat every now and then, but her fitness and nutrition positivity, and just through memes, it's like, oh my gosh, thank you so much for posting mm -hmm. me because it starts my day great. You know, they're, they're eight hours ahead. So um, she's already halfway through her day by the time I wake up. And I'm like, oh, well, you know, she's posting all this positive stuff. That's great. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's powerful. It is. Yeah. So if somebody uh, loves your message and it resonated with them today, what's the best way for them to get in contact with you? So email is great because my, uh, my social media is great too. I mean, sex doc Jill. But I get a lot of, I mean, sex and the internet, right? I get all kinds of stuff and it's hard to weed out legitimate business interests versus people just wanting to tell me TMI stuff. So if it's a legitimate business interest, email would be best, which is jill at the sexologist.org. Right. You might have missed my introduction and my, <laughs> my invitation to be on the podcast if I wasn't so persistent. Right. Yeah. It's sometimes, I mean, sometimes it's hard. Like I feel bad. Sometimes I'll, I'll notice somebody has like a very legitimate uh, pressing concern and it's buried under tons of notifications around like just, no, just things. And I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> this is not my wheelhouse or what have you. So yeah. So email is the most direct way for sure. Um, I, Thank you very much. I'll put that in the show notes below in the blog post as well. Um, but you have retreats. How often do you have retreats for sex education? Yeah. So this, I have all kinds of sex ed in-person events, but this retreat is my first actual retreat that I'm hosting. I'm considering it kind of the, I'm calling it my greatest hits album because it is like the best of all I've ever had. My best classes, my best coaching strategies, my best writing because it includes a workbook you know, just the best of everything that I've done in my entire career in three days in San Diego. So it'll be my first one. Hopefully it goes so well that I hope to do them um, biannually. So this is it's September 13th to 15th in San Diego. And it is on all on sexual self-care specifically. That's fantastic. I'll definitely um, be able to connect our audience with that event. Um, hopefully I can get the podcast episode produced by then and and out as a special bonus because I loved our conversation so far. What do you say in the next, what do you say in the next six to 12 months, we do a Facebook live or an Instagram live and we jump on using social media in a positive way to educate people on what's available mm. other than just this downward spiral of negative self-talk. Ah. After my own heart, yes, I would love to. I would love to, I think that would be so valuable to your listeners and I think it's so important. 
Well, thank you very much. And thank you again for your time. I know it's very valuable, so I won't keep you any longer. Um, but before we jump off, do you want to send us off with like a positive um, mindset reshift, reset, or like a quote that you love or something that's original to you that like would really hit home on our conversation today? Sure. So um, an original quote is, um, you're a sexual person first and you share it second. So this is all about being right within and doing your thing. And then you get to share that with somebody else. So you're, you're always sexual, whether you're in a relationship or not, you're always you. Um, from birth to death, we are all sexual. So yeah, thank you for giving me an opportunity to share it. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks again. And I'll talk to you soon. Yeah, thanks so much. Have a great rest of the day.